Hi, it's Jamie from Gilbert Farm, and today we're gonna do a prepper Q&A. We're gonna answer your questions that you left on last Saturday's video. All right, guys, so I have a list of a bunch of questions from you guys that you left on last Saturday's video. Uh, we're gonna go through them one at a time and uh, try and answer your questions on prepping in general and what we do around here. All right, so the number one question that I was asked and three people asked it was about food storage and space. We have Holly M who says, if I don't have a basement to put a pantry in, what else do you suggest? Maintaining Michelle, how do I prep in a smaller space? And Brianna S, uh, she asked, my prepping question is about space. When you buy a house, do you look at how much space you will need for a pantry? Guys, this is a great question. Now we are lucky enough to be able to have a house that has a basement. This basement uh, maintains a pretty cool temperature, which is really good for canned goods. Canned goods need to be stored under 95 degrees, ideally around the 50 to 70 degree mark. But what happens if you do not have a basement? Uh, you do not have uh, any kind of crawl space. You do not have uh, any kind of root cellar to store your pantry in. Okay, well there's a couple different options for you, in particular for those of you living in small spaces. The very first thing that I would recommend is look into tiny space living. So convertible cabinets, um, any kind of pantry shelves or um, under bed storage units that are going to allow you to store food or store pantry items in very small spaces. They have some great ideas. I've, I've looked them up on Pinterest myself. Really great storage ideas for how to store things. I'm gonna take you over here and show you another example that we've used in this house. All right, so here's just one example of creative use of space. This is something that Jeremy built in our basement on our basement stairs where the stairs lift up and there is storage space underneath the stairs. And this is one way that you can use creative space for storing pantry items. Another thing is underneath the stairs, he built uh, built-in shelves. And again, uh, this is just another way of creating, uh, taking dead space and using it creatively so that you could use that for food pantry storage. So what if you don't have that kind of space? Let me give you another option. So another option for maintaining some sort of uh, emergency food storage when you have a very small space would be thinking of nutrient dense foods that can be put in a small area. This would be things like uh, meal replacement bars. Uh, a lot of you guys who watched my EDC video know that I carry these around with me everywhere. I keep them in my truck, keep them in my purse. These are meal replacement bars. These can be used in an emergency situation. Another thing would be MREs. Now we don't have MREs here, mostly because uh, of our diet with gluten-free. They really don't make gluten-free MREs. Um, and because we have the pantry anyway, but MREs would be a way of storing a whole lot of food in a very small space. Now that's not a working pantry. This would be obviously an emergency situation and that would be some, something else for you guys who are looking to have some sort of emergency food, but you just don't have the space to have an actual working pantry. And then finally, the last option would be renting some sort of storage. Now this is for somebody who's really hardcore on wanting to have maybe a year a year's pantry or something like that, you can get uh, air conditioned storage units and you can store your canned goods in that. Now, obviously that's gonna be an inconvenience having to run and grab the items that you need and then bringing them back. But I have never done the math on this, but it might be worthwhile to look into and see if it's if you're going to uh, save enough money by buying foods in bulk, if that would offset the cost of the storage unit itself. But that would be another option that you guys could use if you had a very tiny space. All right, so the next question that we have is from Candace Walker. Have you ever tried dehydrating foods for storage? And if so, what do you suggest is the best method for storing them? Okay, yes, we used to dehydrate foods ourselves. I had an Excalibur dehydrator, five tray. The thing was is that thing ran for literally two, three years straight. Uh, even though it was low power, um, it just sucked elect electricity nonstop. So we ended up selling it. Uh, I think at some point in the future, I'd like to try a solar dehydrator, um, but uh, that doesn't offset the main problem, which was we eat way more dehydrated foods than what I can possibly dehydrate at home. So let me show you uh, what I do and, um, and how I store it. All right. So here are some dehydrated items, raisins being number one. You can see I have a lot of raisins. I, don't, I think this is like 25 pounds of raisins and I just store it in a food grade container that I got for I think a dollar at Walmart. 
um, and they're just in the bag and then I just take them out as needed and I will go through these in about the course of a year or so and that is how I store my raisins the same thing uh, with you know coconut and cranberries and, and these I all buy in bulk from Azure. I know a lot of people ask me, Azure Standard is one company that I've been using in the past to buy a lot of my bulk items from. Um, and that might be one company that I want to look into for buying your bulk dehydrated items. Let me show you something else that I have. So over here are some of my other dehydrated items that I use. Um, here we have some celery stalks, some dehydrated onions, uh, I have a lot of spices in here too. There's uh, bell peppers. We have some dehydrated peas. Uh, and there's some mushrooms and a few other things in here as well. Uh, these are all kept in their original container. I just keep them in a plastic bin to prevent uh, any rodents from eating through. And I obviously, I check to make sure that nothing is eating through the plastic container. And uh, that is how I store them. If you wanted to store these for very, very long periods of time, I'll probably go through these in about a year, year and a half or so. But if you wanted to store dehydrated foods for a very long time, then I would look into Mylar bags. I have a video on how to use Mylar bags. If you don't know what they are, uh, pull out this bin, I'll show you. These are Mylar bags, and this would be for like very long-term food storage. Just a side note that all of these uh, are in my basement and they are kept in the dark. So sunlight will, at least for these items, uh, sunlight will um, remove some of the uh, vitamins and stuff from the food, uh, also discolor it. Um, so make sure that you when, you, when you do store stuff like this, that you keep it in a dark space. All right, so the next question uh, we have from Cat's Edible Garden. I'd like to know what you have in your medical supplies. And also, uh, Felting Me said the same thing. I'd love to see your natural first aid kit as part of prepping. Um, this is actually a whole video in itself, and I think I'm going to make a whole entire video either next week or the week after on uh, prepping medical supplies, at least the ones that I use. So look for that in an upcoming video because it's just too, um, too much to address in this particular Q&A. We'll get back to you on that. All right, so the second half of Felting Me's question was, uh, also since you store a lot of stuff that needs to be cooked, do you have some sort of camping stove or similar thing to cook them with during a disaster? All right, well, first of all, um, I have a lot of canned goods in my basement and the canned goods are already cooked. So I can just open up a jar of ham or ground beef or uh, potatoes and they're already cooked. I don't need to cook them. They're ready to go right out of the jar. And that would be the majority of or at least a good half of my food storage anyway, um, that does not need to be cooked. Now there are other items such as rice that needs to be boiled, beans and that kind of stuff. And all that can be done on a grill. Now we have just a regular standard grill. We have an extra propane tank. I would love to have many propane tanks, but from a cost effective point of view, uh, one with a spare is good enough for right now. Should I run out of propane? We have a fire pit over here behind us and we have cast iron pans and pots that we can use to just cook over a fire. And then if any of you guys saw in one of our earlier videos, uh, Jeremy made a rocket stove out of an old turkey fryer. I'll leave a link to that video up above. That would be another way that we would be able to cook food uh, in an emergency situation. All right, Brandy Trevino wants to know, um, prep question, should you inform people about prepping if they constantly say it's bananas, but it's a super close family member? Guys, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, a lot of these people who, when they hear the word prepping, they automatically mentally jump to crazy person uh, prepping for zombie apocalypse. And they don't think about the everyday prep with things such as job loss, uh, emergencies, um, injuries that could happen, that sort of thing. You can't make somebody else do something they don't want to do. Uh, prepping is what I consider a very personal thing. Now we put a channel out there, um, or part of our channel is has to do with prepping for those interested in watching it. We're not trying to shove it down anybody's throat. If you're willing to listen, you can listen. If you're not, don't. It's the same thing with family members, no matter how close they are. If they don't want to prep, they don't do it, but that doesn't mean you can't. All right, so the next question is from Kaylin Olson. You have talked a lot about getting food in bulk at a discounted price from various places. I would love if you would go into more detail about what resources you use and what kind of things you look for. 
All right, so when getting into bulk buying, the very first thing that I recommend you do is you create a spreadsheet of every single item that you use year after year um, that doesn't have anything to do with changing diets or anything like that. It's the same thing, like laundry detergent. If Assuming that you use laundry detergent every single year all the time, that's something that's gonna go on your list. Salt, salt is something that you cook with, you need it all the time, that's something that's gonna go on your list. Create a list of all the items that you continually use and then uh, go and price shop with different stores in your area. Figure out how much it is per ounce, per pound, the smallest amount that is consistent through uh, all the different stores, and then find the cheapest place and that is where you're gonna buy in bulk. Uh, one of the main companies that I use for buying in bulk is Azure Standard. Uh, unfortunately, the last couple months they've had some inventory issues, um, so I'm actually at the point right now where I'm shopping around and trying to find other places of ordering from bulk. Um, but that is what I do. Uh, create a list, shop around, find the cheapest place, and Azure Standard is the one that I've been using so far up to this point. I think at some point in the near future I might do a video on how to buy in bulk, in particular if you're just getting started, so you might want to look for that video coming up soon. Next question is from Marika Plasmans. Um, she says, Here's a question, if you only had the money to buy one, which one would you buy first and why? The water bath canner or the pressure canner? Well, first of all, there is a huge difference between a pressure canner and the price of a pressure canner and the price of a water bath canner, like tremendous difference. Um, but assuming that I could only choose one, hands down, without a doubt, the pressure canner. The pressure canner is something that I use on a weekly, if sometimes daily basis. Uh, it is the one that saves the most amount of money. Uh, for me in the long run with being able to can meats and low acid foods. Uh, in an emergency situation, uh, your nutrient dense foods are all gonna be cooked in here, whereas the water bath canner is only for things such as uh, pickled items, jams, jellies, uh, and like tomato sauces, high acid foods, not really nutrient dense. This is the way to go, hands down. This is what I would recommend. The other thing is, is for a water bath canning, you can use any container that you want for water bath canning. Uh, I've seen um, Old Alabama get Gardener use a giant galvanized tub to water bath can in. So uh, as long as you have something on the bottom, uh, like a towel or something to, to separate the burner from uh, the jars from the bottom surface of the container, you're good to go. So my answer is pressure canner. So the second half of Marika's question is, I have a question regarding defense when SHTF occurs. We are not allowed to carry guns where I live and I'm a pacifist. So I would like to hear your thoughts on how to defend myself and my food stock. All right, well, you're talking about two different things. One, defending yourself. Uh, that's where self-defense comes into play. There are several different uh, ways of doing self-defense. Uh, there's Tai Chi, there's Judo, Jiu Jitsu that are more pacifist related. Uh, as opposed to being more aggressive um, forms of self-defense. And those are things that I would look into. I just think that every person should know some sort of self-defense, in particular women. Go take yourself a self-defense class for your personal self-defense. All right, so when it comes to defending your food stock, I am going to probably hear a lot of crap about this, but here is my personal opinion. It doesn't matter uh, if how many guns you have, you are not gonna be able to defend your food source at your home. Um, in particular, if you are in a very populated area like we are, where the majority of the population are not preppers. What's going to happen in an SHTF situation, people are gonna get hungry, they're gonna do whatever they can to get food. That means mass hordes of people are going to come in and start raiding every single home. It doesn't matter if they know you have a pantry or not, every single home is gonna get hit and they're gonna get hit by massive waves of people looking for food. You are not gonna be able to defend yourself against them. Look back at history, look at castles, look at sieges, uh, look at how many people have defended and fought off sieges. You're just not gonna be able to do that. Um, now, if you have a ton of property and you have certain defenses set up, you know that might be a different option, but for the average person uh, in an average, say suburban lot or small lot, you're just not gonna be able to do it. So in that situation, your best defense is going to be stealth and cunning and being able to move on the go. Um, so if you want to maintain food storage, that if, if this is a concern of yours of protecting your food storage, store it off site, bury it, something like that is an option, um, or being able to pack as much as you can and hit the road. That would be my second option. 
And the other part of defending your food source is in a real SHTF situ situation, you're talking complete and total disaster. Probably the number one thing you need to know how to do is how to start over. So if you have to evacuate your home, you have to leave behind your food, you have to go out and hit the road yourself, taking packets of seeds, being able to start over somewhere else is going to be the number one skill that you need to know how to do. So that's my two cents on defending your food source. All right, so the next question is from Susie St. James. My prepping question is for Jeremy. If there was a no electricity crisis, which means no power tools besides the basic toolkit you mentioned in your recent video, what else would you have in your toolbox? And the same question for Jamie. What electric kitchen or garden tools would you duplicate with a manual tool and which electric tools would you use without? I'll let Jeremy step in for his half of the question. Uh, manual tools, uh, no electricity. You need to be able to measure, cut, and fasten any type of raw material into something else, like a shelter or a defense weapon or a hunting weapon or anything like that. Uh, so you can go right back to basics with cordage, like uh, paracord, it allows you to fasten things with it, uh, create traps or snares, measure, um, saw, always have a saw. Duct tape's optional, but I would never go anywhere without duct tape. And then in addition to the basic tools I mentioned before, like a hammer and, and things like that. So measure, cut, fasten. You need tools to be able to do that that do not require electricity. All right, so as far as kitchen tools, I've slowly been replacing my electric tools with uh, manual tools. Things like coffee grinder, beaters, and of course, you know, stocking up on cast iron pans, which can be used uh, in, in on, over an open fire, uh, which you know has nothing to do with electric or not electric. But uh, when you're talking SHTF situation, um, are you talking like, do we have a generator? Because if so, it's very possible that you can run a lot of electric devices off of a generator. Um, but assuming you don't have that, uh, my number one tool that I always use would be a food processor, and I think poss possibly uh, replacing a food processor with some sort of manual food processor would be really helpful in particular uh, when it comes to doing things like making bread. And on that same note, uh, some sort of grain grinder. Now, the, I bought a Wonder Mill, which is electric. Again, I could run that off of a generator if I needed to. Um, however, uh, if there was a complete SHTF situation, having a manual uh, hand crank uh, grain grinder would be like my top notch thing in getting or top recommended thing in getting the problem with those are they run about a thousand dollars as opposed to like 200 bucks for uh, an electric one so they really truly are an investment you really need to make sure you're going down that path and you really need that uh if you're going to invest that kind of money into it all right so the next question is from taniko uh kishimoto and the question is, why are you buying water bottles instead of refilling from the tap? Get some larger bottles, say the gallon size, and use your tap while it's available. Saves money. Obviously, it doesn't work in Flint, Michigan, but you'll also be keeping the excess plastic out of the waste stream. Okay, as far as keeping excess plastic out of the waste stream, uh, we do not use these uh, water bottles at, on a regular basis. These are for emergency use only. So for our everyday use, uh, we have a Brita water filter that we filter our water through and you know, just regular glasses that we drink out of. So we're not using these and these are not, um, this is a one-time purchase only for emergency use. Now, why aren't we using things such as milk jugs? Because I don't buy those items from the grocery store. I don't buy milk jugs or uh, a lot of juice containers or anything like that. So I would have to go out and buy containers to put water in and so that kind of defeats the purpose of going out and buying some sort of plastic container or something anyway. So that's why I buy water bottles. But I do recommend if you have plastic water bottles laying around that you can use those. Of course, you do need to be careful of the plastic leaching, um, such as these, but again, emergency use only. Now, uh, you brought up a really good point with Flint, Michigan and water. You need to have a backup plan for this because if this runs out, uh, if you need potable water, you should have some sort of backup plan. And for us, that's a life straw for purifying water and also uh, water tablets for water purification. So definitely uh, water is a huge part of prepping and something you need to consider for many different aspects no matter how you do it. I'd love to set up a water catchment system. That would be something I'd love to do sometime in the near future. Um, but for right now, the water bottles work for us and having these as a backup system. All right, so the next question is from the I am of me. You've lived through, in my head, the worst case scenario, a major earthquake. Um, I would love to know what you took away from your Nepal experience that you have never thought of before that day. I prepped to stay here to stay put. 
But I know if something like that happens, a big one, I'm not sure staying here would be possible at all. I would love to hear your thoughts and anyone else chime in on ideas for that. Okay. So for those of you guys that are new to the channel, uh, back in April of 2015, I was traveling alone uh, to the country of Nepal when um, a major 7.8 earthquake hit. I'm gonna leave a link to that video. I actually have footage of the earthquake and the aftermath of that. Um, it could have turned out to be a very disastrous situation. It was a disastrous situation for the people of Nepal, uh, but luckily I made it through. Um, it, was, it was a close one for me on that one. And um, so, what did I take away from that experience? I, t I took away so much from that experience. It was it was life changing for me. Um, th that to, to possibly list everything is impossible. Let me try and hit the highlights. Number one, you hear a lot of uh, what if scenarios uh, on YouTube or in blog articles or in, even in books about what could could possibly happen. I've experienced that firsthand. It's one thing to read about it in a book to say, okay, there's no government support, there's no police, there's uh, no ambulances driving along the roads, there's no potable water, uh, either there's no electric, there's no cell phone service, there is nobody there to help you. It's one thing to read about it in a book, it's another thing to experience it firsthand. I can tell you firsthand that that is a very real situation, depending on the extent of a disaster, that there is nobody coming to save you. And I think, I think one of the biggest assumptions by a lot of us here in uh, the United States is that someone is always going to come rescue you or that it's just never going to happen at all. And that is one of the most dangerous things or situations that you can be in. So preparing for an event where you are going to be on your own, where you are going to need to be self-sufficient, self-reliant for everything, for your food, for your water, for your medical supplies, uh, for your housing, everything. That is my biggest takeaway from my trip to Nepal. And that is the one of the number one reasons why we are on the path to becoming more self-sufficient and more self-reliant. Question from Turtle Party. Uh, my son thinks that chickens and turkeys will lure people because they can hear them. I think I'm going to learn to can on an outside wood fire just in case I have to put the roosters and toms in the pot. The hens are not as loud as we live in a secluded wooded area and a quarter mile down our driveway from the road. Maybe enclose them in a building so they can't be heard. What do you think? Well, guys, so here's the thing. I, again, a quarter mile down a road is not very far. If there is a major SHTF situation, you are going to be swamped by a bunch of people looking for food because the majority of people out there are not preppers. And when you have some very, very hungry people, they are very, very motivated to take your food. It's not gonna matter if you have turkeys or chickens or how loud they are. Um, I mean, you're talking, if you need, if you're in a situation where you need to hoard your food, you need to be extremely secluded, extremely hidden, not have any smoke or smell, smells of campfire or smells of food cooking or any kind of noises whatsoever. And that situation is impossible for most people. Um, honest, I don't want to say don't worry about it at this point, um, because it is something to worry about and to think about. That's part of prepping. But as far as not keeping chickens or turkeys or uh, enclosing them up in a box um, because of the noise, I don't think that's going to be an issue. And this is, again, hypothetical. Because if someone's coming to your farm, your house, they're going to check all the buildings, whether there's noise coming from them or not, looking for food. Um, but absolutely, learning to cook outside, learning to can outside, I strongly recommend it. You should be practicing uh, different things that you would do in an emergency situation. So the next question is from Violet Dizzy. And she says that she's working on building up a working pantry and a long-term pantry, rice and things that don't expire quickly. And I feel it's important to eat these items and to be used to cooking them, but running into recipes that have too many ingredients or the kids won't eat. Um, okay, so part of being a prepper is building up your skill set. And one of the skills that I think every prepper needs to know is how to cook, in particular cook from scratch and cook very frugal recipes. Um, and so you're on point here with wanting to do this and wanting to do it now. Now in a real SHTF situation, with regards to your kids, they're gonna eat whatever it is that you give them. Um, and honestly, since you're the person that's buying food for the house, um, if you don't buy all the junk food that they're used to, then they're gonna eat whatever it is you cook for them because they're kids. Now spouse might be a different story because they uh, have more of an adult mindset and more input when it comes to what they're eating or not. But as far as kids, whatever you cook, they're going to eat it. Now, uh, and sometime in the near future, I'm going to do 
a video on different recipes and cookbooks that I refer to when uh, cooking frugally or cooking in emergency situations. So look for that video coming up. But in the meantime, I do have a scratch cooking playlist. I'm gonna to link to that up above um, with basic ingredients that I use all from my pantry. And that will give you a good head start until that other video comes out. All right, and the last question is from Xana the Great. My prep question is this. Do you plan on taking any of those pantry items with you if you have to evacuate? If so, how much and what do you take and how when it's so heavy and bulky? Well, when it comes to prepping, my number one thing is to try and bug in if possible. So I am planning on staying here in any kind of emergency. However, in the situation where I would have to leave, I have my food set up in these totes, my high protein items, my high carbohydrate items, where I'm going to grab these and run out the door. So for example, this tote right here is pretty easy to grab. I can lift this up, throw it in the back of a pickup truck and I have probably about 10 pounds of navy beans in just one bag here alone. And I'm able to grab this and out the door and this is gonna provide me with, and my family, with a couple weeks worth of food. If I can grab two of them, it doubles that. If I can grab three, I can triple that. Uh, and so packing those up in the vehicle, making sure that my gas tank is half full so I can get out of town, um, is going to provide us with a, a significant amount of food without having to um, load up all of the jars and take those with us. Obviously, if we have time, we're gonna to wanna to try and grab those if possible. So if there is a situation where I can't grab this, this tote or I need to backpack it out of here, that's why I have uh, numerous boxes of these meal replacement bars. Uh, what I would do is I would uh, grab a lot of these, throw them in a backpack and head out the door. And if I don't have time to do that, I already have them in a purse and I already have them in a backpack. And these are going to at least buy me some time until I can get someplace where I can get food. And that would be absolute dire get out the door right now emergency. All right, so that wraps it up for our prepping Q&A. We had a lot of questions, a lot of very good questions. Uh, I just wanna say that I am not the expert in prepping. Um, I try to prep for as many situations as I can with a limited budget. Obviously, if I had an unlimited budget, there are a lot more things I would do, um, a lot, many more things that I would do. But given what I have and what I have to work with, this is what I can do and what I am doing. So I hope it's been helpful to you guys. Uh, if you guys are preppers and you guys have any tips or tricks for any of the questions that you've heard in this video, feel free to leave them down below. I think all input is useful here and it helps everybody. So feel free to leave it down below. If you like this kind of stuff, like subscribe. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.